Well, good morning and, okay, settle down. I will pull this church over right now. Settle down. Let's lower those expectations. Um, Good morning. My name is Kevin McPeak, and uh, I am thrilled to be here. I love being at Torrey Pines Church. I'm one of the pastors in our church network, and it's really a privilege for me to be here for this final week of this Welcome Christmas series, where we've been looking at this idea of of preparing ourselves for Christmas, and not the to-do list, not the shopping list, not all the stuff that has to get done, but really getting our hearts and our minds ready for what Christmas really ought to be. And today what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, five things we need to remember for Christmas. And if you're like me, you immediately think that 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 feels like one of those clickbait articles on a web page. It's like five things to remember about Christmas. Number three will shock you, right? It's not that. If you see pages like that, please do not click on them. They're just going to waste your time. But we want to look at what, what are the really important things we should remember about Christmas. For me, um, my Christmases as a kid growing up were pretty different from what my Christmases are like today. I've mentioned before, I grew up in a small town in upstate New York. Uh, my hometown is about 1,300 people. And uh, because the weather there is very cold, it's just outside Syracuse, New York, the snow starts falling in like, honestly, like late October, early November, you can start to get snow. And the snow stops falling sometime in like June. And actually, it, it's not terribly far off. You'll get, you'll get snow in uh, March and April. And in fact, one year we had snow on Mother's Day and my mom cried. But for Christmas, because you get snow so much and so early, I would say 75% of the time, 80% of the time, uh, we would have a white Christmas. And that's just what I was used to. And I lived my, my whole life up until I went away to college in one small town. And so Christmas for me kind of looked like this. And this is how I thought everybody's Christmas looked, is that sort of thing like snow and lights on the tree and a house and a small town. Like that's, that's how I thought everybody did it. That's what I thought everybody's Christmas experience was like. And then I went away to college and I went to college in Miami, Florida. Now... <laughs> Miami could not be more different from where I grew up. And I remember my very first December as a freshman in college, walking around, and I saw that people put lights on palm trees, and it looked kind of like this. And I was thinking, "Um, you're not doing Christmas right. That's incorrect. You're executing Christmas the wrong way. And then I'd go back to my hometown and spend Christmas there, and sometimes that white Christmas would turn into like sleet, and freezing rain. And I began to think, maybe I'm the one that's not doing Christmas right. And over the years, I've become a convert to warm weather Christmas. I'm unapologetically in favor of San Diego Christmas. I love it. I think it's the best available Christmas. And my whole family is still back in the Northeast. And so I like to check the weather on Christmas Day and see that it's like 16 degrees and freezing rain there. And then with our family, we will be like, hey, you know what? Let's go to the Hotel Dell and look at the ice skating next to the beach. (laughs) And then I go, you know what? They're not doing Christmas right. We're doing Christmas right. But, But here's what we often do is we get this expectation of we're doing Christmas right or we're doing Christmas wrong or it's not matching our expectation of what it ought to be, what it should be. And and, and we get kind of frustrated sometimes when somebody's not doing it the way we think it ought to be done, or sometimes it's not being done the way we want it to be done for ourselves. And at least the first thing that we should remember about Christmas, it's your first fill-in, whether you're using the app or the paper outline, and that's this. Remember that Christmas is different for everyone. Now, I know that that's an obvious statement of truth, right? Everybody experiences it differently. But what happens is if we forget that, we can get a little bit judgy about how other people are experiencing Christmas, or we can kind of get dissatisfied with how we're experiencing Christmas. See, people will experience, experience all the external factors differently. We can, we can have lots of different ways to walk through it. Let me give you some examples. Do you have a snowy Christmas, a white Christmas, or not? Do you have open presents on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day? Do you believe that Die Hard is a Christmas movie or are you just wrong, right? There are two options, right? And honestly, all of those are pretty insignificant. Really, they are. They're insignificant differences in the grand scheme of things for how people experience Christmas differently. But there are more significant ways that are different for people. So, for instance, for some people, Christmas is really a time of joy and family. But for other people, it's a time of real loneliness and isolation. For a lot of people... 
Christmas is a time to be reunited with loved ones that you haven't seen all year. But for a lot of other people, Christmas is a time that there's that empty chair at the table that just reminds you of that person you lost. For, and for, for some people, Christmas is this great reminder of like the joy of being a kid and what Christmas was like when you were a kid. But for other people, Christmas was really hard as a kid. And every year you kind of stir up some of those painful memories. Uh, for me, Christmas as a kid was kind of emotionally loaded. It was a little, little challenging and difficult for me. My parents split up when I was six, and what they had agreed to was that uh, I and my siblings would spend Christmas Eve with my dad and Christmas Day with my mom. And I remember some of my friends were like, oh, that's so cool, you get to have two Christmases. That's not really how it felt. What it felt like was I had two kind of half Christmases. Like, it never really felt like I got to experience the whole thing. So for me, Christmas was kind of a complicated thing, even as a little kid. Like, how do I, how do I navigate how I feel about this? And there's this, this larger truth for all of us in the middle of it, whether Christmas is this nonstop fun fest for you, or you kind of go, oh, this is, this is going to be hard for me this year. There's, there's a commonality that we do share across all of our experiences, which is this. It's the second thing we can remember. It's Jesus is the same. For everyone. See, Christmas is all about him. And I know that seems obvious, but it's so easy for us to forget. And in the middle of that, Jesus is the same for everybody. It's all about him. And I know some people, they, they get really bent out of shape about the commercialization of Christmas. And it's just, it, it bothers some people that, you know, there's, there's Santa and the reindeer and they just want it to be about Jesus. And I understand that. But I honestly, I'm grateful that Christmas is such a, a, a cultural touchstone for people. Why? Because it gives you a chance to talk about Jesus. It's a, it's a connection point for Jesus. So we, we, we can, I think, lose track of the original meaning of Christmas, but, but sometimes I think even, even in the church, we sometimes lose track of the, of the original meaning of Christmas. I, I know for sure, like there's so many uh, like messages in media that get us distracted about the true meaning of Christmas. There are, I think, two networks that 24-7 are devoted to movies about the true meaning of Christmas. These are, of course, Lifetime and the Hallmark Channel that sometime around Labor Day started showing these Christmas movies. They're all the same movie, 24-7, and it's, you know, it's always the, the... overworked single woman in a big city and she has to go back to her small town for some reason and then she meets a guy she went to high school with and they don't really get along but then they find that they get along and then there's a romance budding but then something happens and she has to go away and he goes to the airport, don't leave, don't leave, don't leave. She stays, they find out the true meaning of Christmas, end of movie. Then they show another one but it's two different actors and they're in a different town, right? That's not in my notes. I just, it's true. If you've ever watched those movies, if you've seen one, you've seen 8,000 of them. Um, and if you've seen 8,000 of them, you've actually only seen one. But what they, what they all rest on is this, this thing where it's, we have to discover the true meaning of Christmas. And everybody wants to know the true meaning of Christmas. And it's all about, like, how do we find the true meaning of Christmas? And unpopular opinion alert, the real true meaning of Christmas is not Family. It's actually not. It's not being with the ones you love. It's not actually goodwill towards other people. Those are all great things. And those are all part of Christmas, for sure. But they're all secondary to the true, actual meaning of Christmas, which is Jesus. That's actually the real meaning of Christmas. And if you wonder, like, how can you back that up? Well, go with his name, Jesus Christ. It's right in the name of Christmas right? It's right there. Christmas is truly about Jesus. And I know that sometimes seems so obvious, but we forget that. We get so distracted by all the other stuff. And I'm not saying that all the other stuff is bad. It's not. Like, please don't interpret this as like, you need to go take down your Santa decorations and all that. Like, I'm not saying any of that stuff. What I'm saying is we just want to focus on really what matters. There's a tremendous book in the Bible that I love dearly. It's the book of Isaiah. And the book of Isaiah, uh, if you look at the chronology of the Bible, where it stands, it was actually written hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus. And a lot of what is in there is prophecy. It's talking about the future. And it also details what God has done in the past. So it's it's this sort of big overview book. In Isaiah 43, it says this 
about us getting trapped in sort of the nostalgia of things. It says this, this is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. What, what God is saying is, here's all the stuff I did. Here are all these things I did for my people. But then the passage carries on and says this, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. And, and that's a really fascinating passage of Scripture because if you think about what's being said, it's this, it's this litany, this catalog of this is what God did. And he details all of it. And then he says, now, forget all that. I want you to focus on a new thing. And, and you can read that and go, oh, okay, well, which is it? Are we supposed to remember those things or are we supposed to forget those things? And here's what I'd suggest. It's, it's really about not being held captive by the past. It's, it's about not getting so caught up in what happens that we forget who made it happen. That's the important thing that we look at. It's not about remembering the events. It's about the author, the actor in the middle of those events. He who made a way in the sea. So it's saying, forget the things, forget the stuff, but remember who's behind it all. In other words, this brings us to the third thing we want to remember. Remember who Jesus is. There's an earlier passage in that same book of Isaiah. And it details some prophecies about the Messiah. Now, I just used two words that if you're new to church, you're kicking the tires of faith, you may not know exactly what I mean when I say that. So let me explain what I mean. When we say prophecy, what prophecies are, prophecies are statements of what will happen. Okay, so biblical prophecy is this is a thing that is going to happen in the future. And sometimes it's the near future. There can be prophecy that, that happens very shortly after the prophecy is spoken, or there can be long-term prophecy. The book of Revelation is full of prophecy that's, that's all, you know, a long time after that is written when, it, when it's going to come to pass. But the point of prophecy is these are things that are going to happen. And when it's prophecy about the Messiah, let me explain what the Messiah is. The Messiah is this long-awaited Savior and Deliverer of the Jewish people. Okay, so they've been waiting so long for this Messiah. And in the, in the book of Isaiah, it has very detailed descriptions and predictions about the Messiah. And the reason this is important is it gave people sort of this, this blueprint to go, okay, whoever fulfills this, whoever does these things will be the Messiah. So we should look for these characteristics in someone, and then we'll know that they are the Messiah. And this passage may be familiar to you because it's, it's one that's referenced a lot around Christmas. It says this in Isaiah 9, 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, uh, some of you may know that I'm a little bit of a music nerd. Now, all of you know that I'm a nerd, you can tell just by looking at me, but the music part you might not have been aware of, but I actually, I have my, my bachelor's and my master's degree are both in music. Uh, I've spent a lot of my career as a musician. I actually have been a full-time college music professor. I love talking about music. I love thinking about music. I love listening to music. And it's, it's just like fascinating to me. So I'm going to kind of nerd out for you for a second here. There's a brilliant oratorio called Messiah. Many of you would be familiar with it. In an oratorio, if you're not familiar with what that is, an oratorio is sort of a, a large-scale musical work, and it would have like a, a symphonic orchestra and a choir, and it's, it's just, you know, sort of a big work that you listen to. And, and this, this piece called Messiah was written by George Frederick Handel in 1741. And it's an incredible piece. It wasn't actually intended as a Christmas piece. It actually details the entire life of Jesus. And it's fascinating, but it actually gets performed a lot around Christmas because there's a section that's largely about the birth of Jesus. And so it's sort of in our culture been attached to Christmas time, which is great because it's a phenomenal work. And all of the lyrics actually come out of Scripture. And what I, I think is really incredible, and, and the reason we should treat it as a big deal, one of the reasons we should treat it as a big deal, is it's one of the very first oratorios that was written in the English language. There were a lot of oratorios written in other languages. There's a Christmas oratorio that Bach wrote in 1734 that is entirely in German. So if you really want to understand what's happening in it, you 
probably need to speak German, or you're going to miss a lot of the meaning of what's happening. But in Messiah, it's all sung, it's written in English, and it's just the scriptures in English sung to you. And if you're thinking, well, okay, you're talking about this, this work, I, I probably, I don't think I've ever heard this music. You've heard at least this segment of, the, of Messiah. Right? You've heard this. Everybody's heard this. This is the Hallelujah Chorus from Handel's Messiah. Everybody's familiar with that piece. And you might think, well, yeah, I think I've heard that. I can't remember where. I didn't go to a concert hall. I'm sure I didn't like hear it live with a symphony. And honestly, probably what it was is maybe you're a parent and one of your kids like cleaned their room or took out the trash without asking and suddenly like angels appeared and it was like... It just went... Like it, it's, a, it's a miracle. It's a Christmas miracle. I didn't even ask and they did it, right? But it's, it's, this, it's this incredible work. And one of the, I would say, better known parts of it is that very scripture that we read, Isaiah 9, 6, set to music. It's called, For Unto Us a Child is Born. And you've probably heard it, and it goes a little bit like this. So it's all of those words of scripture, these, these prophecies. And it, it's, if you listen to it, you'll hear all these lines start to intermingle. And it's really brilliant, brilliant writing, brilliant music. And it then jumps to saying what these names are, these titles, these descriptions of Jesus, of the wonderful counselor, the almighty God, the prince of peace. And it, it's, it sings them like this. If you get a chance to listen to this piece before Christmas, I can't recommend it enough. It's just such a great piece. But that moment where it talks about these descriptions of God, they're really meaningful. And, and I don't want us to gloss over. I don't want us to just kind of zoom past that. It talks about wonderful counselor. Now, when you and I say wonderful, what we mean is, I was really good. Hey, how was your vacation? Oh, it was wonderful. It was a really good vacation. When Scripture says wonderful, it means something bigger than that and actually more literal than that. It means that we would be filled with wonder because what we are seeing, what we are experiencing is beyond human comprehension, that it truly fills us with wonder. And this notion of a counselor, it's not like a therapist or a guidance counselor. Those are good things. It's this notion of like a majestic ruler giving us wise advice. So you put this together, this wise advice from a majestic ruler that defies comprehension. That's the wonderful counselor that it speaks of. And then it talks about mighty God. Please do not miss the importance of this. This is an incredibly significant theological statement that's being made in Isaiah 9-6. It's saying that this, this person that would be, be born, this Messiah, would be mighty God. People will say, I, you know, I like Jesus. I, yeah, I think, he's, I think he's a great moral teacher. I think he had a lot of good, good things to say, but I don't think he was God. Well, here's the thing. At least according to Scripture, that's who he claimed to be. There's, there's not a lot of middle ground on that. And Isaiah 9, 6 says this Messiah would be mighty God, born as a, as a person, but also fully God at the same time. And, and it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly significant claim to make about someone. And then it describes him as an everlasting father. And that in and of itself, there's, there's a subtlety to that that I think we shouldn't miss. When, when there's a relationship between a father and a child, that relationship changes over time. When the child is, is young, the father is much more the, the protector, the caretaker, the provider at all times. And as that child grows, the, the significance of the father's role as a protector, a provider, a caretaker, that diminishes. And then they become really more of maybe a mentor and an advisor over time. What this is saying is that for all time, everlastingly, God is the father. That he is always the protector, that he is always the caretaker, that he is always the provider. And we don't ever grow out of that. We don't ever get to the point where God's like, eh, I'm done with you, fend for yourself, right? It's saying he's everlastingly our father, that he's always going to be in the middle of that for us. And then it says he's the prince of peace. 
He's literally the opposite of everything we're surrounded by. All the chaos, everything that makes us uncertain, everything that makes us fearful. That Jesus is the prince of peace. That he stands in absolute opposition to all of that chaos that seeks to destroy us. And so he's all of these things. And there's so many other names for Jesus in the Bible. And we don't have time to get into them all because I know if, if I don't say that, someone will come up to me after, after service and be like, well, actually, he's also the good shepherd. Yeah, I know, okay? We don't have time to get into all of them. Don't be the well, actually person after service, okay? But these, these names, these descriptions of Jesus are meaningful. And I would encourage you to like grab hold of them because they can help you and they are truly valuable. And as we remember all of these names of Jesus, these characteristics of who he is, we should also remember this. Remember what Jesus has done. I, I won't say anything about the rest of you, but I will just say this about myself. I can be incredibly forgetful. I just tend to forget things. But you know who is more forgetful than at least me? Kids at Christmas. Kids at Christmas are the most forgetful people in the world. And you might think, well, what do you mean by that? They open a present. You spent hours driving all over the place trying to find this toy. It wasn't at this store. Then you went to this other store. They said they had it, but they don't have it. And then you finally get to the other store and you wait in line for two hours. You finally get the toy. You get it. And they open it up on Christmas morning. They look at it for three seconds and they go, okay, what's next? Right? They forgot that you just got them this amazing gift and they just move on to the next thing. Uh, there's a video that Guy sent to me, and it's hilarious. And I'm, I'm going to set it up for you so you can see it. So here's, here's the premise. Uh, it's a video of a boy. He has received $50 for Christmas. He's upset because his brother got a PS4, a, a video game console, but he got 50 bucks. And he doesn't think that's fair. So uh, without any further delay, an angry child at Christmas. <laughs> Kyle, Kyle, Gabbard, Kyle, no! What? You're an ungrateful... You're an ungrateful You're brat. You're you! You're a brat. No, I'm not! You're... I only got 50 bucks! Yeah, go buy candy. Candy? Chip. Why couldn't I have gotten a PS4? Actually, I already have a PS4. But that was from last Christmas! So, <laughs> that's, that's the worst advertisement for volunteering in children's ministry. None of our children are like that. Um, hopefully you didn't miss the subtlety on that. He's mad because he didn't get the gift that his brother got, but that's because he got it last year. He's mad because he didn't get the gift that he already owns, because he's forgotten. And it's easy to point at that and go, ah, oh, that's funny, but I do that. I do that with God all the time. I do that with God when, when I see something good happens in somebody else's life, and I'm like, well, how come that didn't happen for me? Oh, wait, it did. I just forgot. Or, or I'll get mad about this, this thing I'm dealing with that's difficult, and then I'll go, oh, I've forgotten all the good things that God's done for me. See, we can all be forgetful like that. We don't remember the goodness of God. In the 17th chapter of Luke, there's a story about where this actually happens. Um, here's, here's how it goes. It says this, as he entered one village, and he is Jesus. So as Jesus entered one village, 10 men approached him, but they kept their distance, for they were lepers. Let me pause and say, just to explain that, if someone had leprosy because that was an infectious disease, they were required to stay away from everyone else. They could mingle among themselves, but they couldn't mingle with the people who were not infected with leprosy. So they keep their distance. And then they shouted to him, mighty Lord, our wonderful master, won't you have mercy on us and heal us? When Jesus stopped to look at them, he spoke these words, go to be examined by the Jewish priests. Let me just explain, because that's actually a little more significant than we may realize. He's not saying, uh, not my problem. When you go to be examined by the Jewish priests, it's because perhaps, perhaps you have been healed and only the Jewish priests could certify that you were clean and you could return to society. So for Jesus to say, go, go be examined by the Jewish priests, they're going, did, did he heal us? And so they, they walk, they carry on. So they set off, and they were healed while walking along the way. One of them, a foreigner from Samaria, 
when he discovered that he was completely healed, turned back to find Jesus, shouting out joyous praises and glorifying God. When he found Jesus, he fell down at his feet and thanked him over and over, saying to him, you are the Messiah. Now, this man was a Samaritan. And pause again. The Jewish people and the Samaritans did not have good feelings about each other. Okay, the Jewish people would not, as a rule, associate with Samaritans. They were like other. And in this story, Jesus is healing a Samaritan, and a Samaritan comes back to thank Jesus. And Jesus c- continues on. He says this, So where are the other nine? Jesus asked. Weren't there ten who were healed? They all refused to return to give thanks and give glory to God, except you, a foreigner from Samaria. Then Jesus said to the healed man lying at his feet, arise and go. It was your faith that brought you salvation and healing. See, 10 men had been healed, but only one of them, this foreigner, this person that was sort of the other, the person we don't associate with, that's the guy who came back and made a point to thank Jesus for what he had done for him. See, in the process of being thankful, that man's life was changed. Personally, I don't want to get through this season without stopping, without pausing, and making sure that I thank Jesus for what he's done for me. See, when I read that story, I see somebody in that man from Samaria that I go, I need to be a little more like that. I need to be somebody who pauses and goes back and expresses gratitude to Jesus, expresses gratitude to others. Somebody who just pauses and is more grateful. I want to be a pauser. I want to be a go back and thanker, but sometimes I'm not. And that's one of the reasons, unapologetically, I'm grateful that we have that Christmas offering that that Pastor Mingo was talking about earlier. It's an opportunity for me to go back and be grateful, to express my gratitude and say, God, you have made such a difference in my life and in the life of, of my family. And I just, I want to express my gratitude by just being a part of the good work you're doing. And so that's, that's why our family is a part of it. And I, I will say this, if, if you're new around here, I don't have any expectation that you would give towards this church. Like, you should figure out that we're not a bunch of weirdos before you do that. That's fine. I get that. The Christmas offering, I'll just tell you, plain fact, none of that money staying with us. So even if you're new around here, if you want to give to the Christmas offering, I can promise you, all that money's going out the door. It's all going to organizations that we believe in, that we partner with, that do good work in the world to advance the kingdom. That's, that's what we do with that. And so you can, you can get to that and, and great things will happen. And it's a way for us to express our gratitude. You can check out all the info in your program, but I'll just tell you, it's, it's one of those ways we can express gratitude. There's another scripture that talks about someone expressing gratitude to Jesus. And the story we read in Luke Uh, just a moment ago. It's similar to a story in chapter 5 of Mark. In chapter 5 of Mark, Jesus has just healed a man who was possessed by a demon. And uh, after Jesus healed him, this man was so grateful that he wanted to go along with Jesus and travel with him. And Jesus had this interesting response. Jesus answered, no. But then he said to him, go back to your home and to your family and tell them what the Lord has done for you. Tell them how he had mercy on you. So the man left and went to the region of Jordan and parts of Syria to tell everyone he met about what Jesus had done for him and all the people marveled. That's kind of hilarious because Jesus spent so much of his adult ministry walking around and going, hey, you, come with me. You, come with me. Hey, come with me. All right, everybody, hey, come with me. And he's got this whole crew. And this, this one guy goes, hey, can I come with you? And Jesus is like, nah. <laughs> I have to think that maybe didn't feel so good. But it wasn't, nah, you're not cool enough to be in our our group. That's not what he was communicating. What he was communicating was, no, I have other work for you. And the work I have for you is that you go back to your people. Tell them what has happened. Because they will believe it coming from you. Because they knew, the people he was coming from, they knew he had been possessed by demons. They knew this man was, was not right. And then he comes back and he's different and they're going to go, how did this happen? Well, let me tell you about Jesus. See, what happens to us through Jesus is not stuff that we keep to ourselves. And that brings us to our fifth thing that we need to remember this Christmas season. And that's this, what Jesus said and then talk about it. Christmas matters because it's the dawn. It's the very beginning of the story of Jesus being among his people. The whole point 
of Christmas is Jesus being among the people he loves so much. All of us. You probably know the Christmas song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. We actually sang a song earlier in the, in the, in the service, God with us. That's, that's what Emmanuel translates as. That song is a prayer, O Come, O Come, God with us. It's this request that God would be among us. And what we ought to do is extend an invitation so that other people can experience that same thing. As, as we head into the final days before Christmas, I, I want to challenge you just a little bit. Here's the challenge. Um, this is a season where a lot of people are looking for hope and they're looking for encouragement. And they're alone or they're experiencing, it, experiencing the Christmas season in a way that it wasn't what they were expecting or hoping for. And so they're discouraged. And they're looking for encouragement and hope and a place to belong. And I know a place where they can experience that. It's here. It's this church. And I know that because I've seen it. This is a place that welcomes people and encourages people. And so here's the, here's the challenge I want to give you is, would you be willing to invite somebody to come for a Christmas Eve service? See, there's, there's two times a year where people are more open than any other time of the year to attending a, a church service. That's Christmas and Easter. That's why we have so many CEOs that attend our church at that time. That's Christmas and Easter only. That's what that means. Some of you will get that joke later. You spell it out. But here's, here's the thing. People will be more open to receiving that invitation at Christmas. And so you can invite people. I'll push a little further. You should invite people. That's, that's something you should do. Now, it doesn't have to be this pressure-filled, like, awkward, uncomfortable thing. Please don't make it that. Let me give you three simple things that you can do to, to just invite people to be a part of Christmas services this year. Here's the first. You can do this right after service. Go take a selfie of you or go take a selfie of you with your family in front of that super cool Christmas tree that we have on the fountain that you can see at night from space, okay? <laughs> go take a picture in front of that thing, post it on social media and say, I'm so looking forward to Christmas Eve services at Torrey Pines Church. I'm going to be at the whatever, 3 p.m. service, 5 p.m. service, 7 p.m. service, whatever. I'd love to see you there. Post it. That's just a way to let people know, hey, I'm going to be there and I'd love to have you join me. A, a second way that you can do it is think of somebody you know who might be a little discouraged this Christmas. Maybe they've had a hard year. Maybe they've experienced a loss. Maybe they're lonely. Invite them to come to service with you. And then sit with them, be with them. A third thing you can do is just take that invitation card in your program that, that we said. It's actually not for you to hold on to. That's for you to give away. And give it to somebody who could use that message of encouragement. It's a coworker, or, or maybe it's, it's somebody at school or a neighbor or a family member. And then when you invite them to come to service with you, here's the thing. Sit with them. Because the first time you come to a church, it can be a little intimidating. You don't know what the rules are. You don't know when you're supposed to stand, sit, all that sort of stuff. If they come alongside you, they've got sort of a, a, a guide. They've got somebody who can walk them along. They, they basically got a Sherpa to guide them through the process. That's you. You can be the security blanket for somebody. But just make that invitation. Any chance you've got in the next 10 days, talk about it. Just let somebody know, I would love to have you join me. What a nice thing to hear, right? I mean, who doesn't want to hear like, man, I'd love to have you join me. Now, you might be antisocial like I am sometimes and be like, well, no, I already have a church. That's fine. But like just inviting somebody is a nice gesture and they might actually take you up on it. In Luke 14, Jesus gives this instruction about the kingdom of heaven and how people are going to be invited to be a part of it. At the end of the story, he says this, well then, go out to the highways and hedges and bring in the complete strangers you find there. And so my house is completely full. Jesus wants his house full. And so our job is to go out into the hedges and the highways and invite people to be a part of this so they can hear that message of hope that Christmas brings. I'm going to invite the, the worship team back up. They're going to share a song with us in just a moment. And as they come up, I just want to remind you of, of these basic things we can remember. 
as we head towards Christmas. We can remember and allow for some flexibility because the experience of Christmas is different for everybody, but, but let's remember that Jesus is the same for everybody. And, and we need to remember who Jesus is and what he's done and what he said and then talk about it with people. Because that message, that offering of hope that we can give to people is so valuable this time of year. So I just want to encourage you, as we head into these final days into Christmas, would you be open? Would you be open to extending that invitation? Would you be open to, to welcoming someone into this experience at your side? Would you pray with me? Jesus, I thank you for the way that you have come to be among us. We thank you for the gift of your presence. Lord, as we approach this Christmas season, we pray that we would be open to what you're doing, that we would, we would heed your voice, and that we would, we would be inviters, that we would be bringers, that we would be encouragers, that we, we would be people who would pause. We would say thank you to you, and then, Lord, we would extend invitations to other people. We thank you for what you're doing. We love you, Lord, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.